Hey everybody, welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show, <clears throat> and and welcome to uh, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture, my summer interview series that's uh, still rocking with some great interviews with uh, people that, whether they're icons of pop culture or they do something that's iconic with uh, with pop culture, today I have with me a guy who uh, has done a little bit of both, more or less, uh, in his career of, uh, of movie making, but also like making monsters and and creatures and stuff like that. His name is Vince, and uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Yes, it's Vince Guastini. Um, I uh, run a special makeup effects company here in uh, Hollywood, California, which is located behind the Burbank Airport. And um, we've uh, been doing animatronics and creatures probably now for over 20 some odd years. Um, we are a boutique shop here in L.A., and uh, we cater to both studio films and low-budget independent movies, as well as um, kind of branching off into actually uh, producing films, um, and as well as uh, getting uh, content for uh, entertainment and, um, and getting into production. So that's uh, kind of what the, the history of the company's been. We've done uh, my company um, and myself, um, which is called VGP Effects and Design Studio, uh, which is a variation for Vincent Guastini Productions. We've done uh, movies from uh, um, Leslie Regina, um, Our Place of Our Father, Requiem for a Dream, Dogma, Stephen King Spinner. Um, we've uh, done design development on, um, you know, um, anything from TV, like Battlestar Galactica when it was in its first incarnations when it was a movie with Brian Singer, uh, to uh, Preacher and uh, comic book uh, designs for Hack Flash and uh, Hannibal, and so we've been doing a lot in that area, uh, not only with uh, practical makeup effects, but also doing um, design work and, um, and uh, development work for studios as well. Wow, it seems like you, you have a lot uh, on your plate anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, when you're in business over 20 some odd years now and, uh, and doing stuff like this, um, you know, it's nice to know that you're, you're going somewhere. And uh, yeah, I think after 20 years of having accumulated this much, then there, you know, there's definitely something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad that uh, you know uh, things are good, and um, you know, and especially in a time when um, you know a, a lot of movies are big studio films with CGI, sure. and um, and a lot of times practical effects has been getting looked over and uh, and, and and passed aside, and even if you know. Studios uh, do get lucky enough to be hired. And the effects studios get to be hired to do practical. Most of the stuff is replaced, and it's becoming uh, a thing now where I think it's making a resurgence. And I think a lot of practical effects, um, even in bigger movies, um, is now uh, coming to the forefront um, uh, again. Um, there, things are getting more luckier, uh, you know, as far as you know the practical stuff making it through. So um, it. It's nice to be one of those people. I'm honored to be one of the studios, um, and it's only a small fraction, a very small fraction, few that um, are part of that club in, here in Hollywood. Wow, no, that that's cool, and it seems like you 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 love what you do, and that's what makes it so great. Because uh, you know, I, I know a lot of studios are, are you know are doing their work so they can make a lot of money, but but uh, I'm sure there's a passion and a drive that you have. Uh, if that's the reason why you did it in the first place or started your company in the first place? Well, I, I want to tell you something about myself. Um, um, I am um, uh, an older person, <laughs> an older <laughs> middle-aged person, and um, my mentality um, is of somebody that's in their 20s. Okay. I've been being in this business a long, long time and doing a lot of stuff and have been through a lot. You know, uh, you know, running a business and doing this stuff, you can go through a lot of times. Um, you can also go through a lot of changes. Uh, also, the business, you let it, um, with, because uh, it is show business, and it is a business, and it's also show business. You can run into a lot of, um, you know, times where, you know, things don't go smoothly, or you don't get along with certain people, or certain things happen in your life, and you just need not to eat you alive enough that it will hinder you. Um, because it is a very difficult business, and, uh, you know, it could be both a wonderful, wonderful business. It could be both a very kind of rough, and, uh, you know, um, and you can, you know, and, and, and things change. 
So um, you need to adapt to those changes. And as far as my love for this stuff, um, you will not find, um, this is my, my, my badge, you will not find anybody more that, that loves this stuff more than I do. And, and, you know, I've both gotten a lot of stuff that benefits from this, and I've also given up a lot of stuff in my life, you know, to run a business like this. So um, it's a double-edged sword. And so if you keep that in mind and know that, um, I think you can forge ahead. So how did uh, the love of uh, uh, film and love of movies uh, uh, happen for you? Like, how did it all, how, what was the beginnings like for you? I think it was just being, being at home and, um, and having a big imagination and uh, watching the 430 movie uh, back in New York on WPIX Channel 11 back, uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, watching Godzilla movies. Ray Harryhausen and Sinbad movies, and then when the great great eighties came around with the, you know stuff like the Howling, America Werewolf, um, that stuff is what you know kind of sparked you know, um, and then Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, before the eighties, uh, and then as we got to the 80s, as I said with all these movies, it just kind of sparked something in me. I, I knew I wanted to do something in film. I want I was sculpting at a very young age, um, on and off, and then um, I thought I wanted to be a producer, a director at first. That was kind of my first thing. I started doing like eight millimeter movie versions of Star Wars, and um, and a stop motion film that I actually got to show Ray Harryhausen um, at a convention. Um, um, so doing that stuff, it, it you know, and then when like I said, the eighties came, it progressed into oh, you know what, stop motion takes too long. And I don't have enough patience for it. I need instant gratification. I'm going to do monsters. And when I saw The Thing, and I saw American Werewolf and the Howling, um, that stuff really kind of said to me, I'm going to be a special makeup effects artist and do creatures and have an impact like my favorite artist had. Uh, you know, when I saw The Thing, Rob Bottin, who's my favorite artist in makeup effects, and Rick Baker and, and all the rest of the great heroes. Uh, Stan Winston, the late great Stan Winston, and other people that that just sparked an interest in me to say this is what I want to do. So that's what started all that. And my mother and father taking me to many, many horror films. <laughs> and when I was a kid, um, you know, kind of put the you know the foundation or the seed in my brain that uh, is what drives me to this day. Oh wow! Well, that's pretty cool that to have parents that were so uh, supportive. Because most parents, like, like I tell you what, you know, like when I do these interviews and stuff, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting paid for it. I'm just doing it because it's a just a love of the work, more or less, and love the fact that I can talk to many different people who have do things with uh, the entertainment business. My parents still to this day still think it's a hobby. And uh, something that you'll never get paid for, but I'm sure your parents, you know, you know, want to make sure that you knew what you know what was realistic and not realistic. I suppose when it comes to making money off well, this. Well, my, my my mother and father was supportive, and my mother was very supportive, but she was also very hard on me because she'd always be like, "Listen, you know, I'm really worried. You have to make money." And um, and uh, so there would always be this thing in me where I would be punched awake, like you need to get a job, you need to do this, you need to keep yeah. moving, you need to do this, you need to do that. And so with that type of upbringing, it was it was tough because uh, my mother's a very strong personality, and um, and um, I'm thankful for it. But yeah, it it really is what you know put me in this mode of when things too many days or weeks pass by there's something you're not doing so you better keep on top of you know pushing 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 and i feel like i've been running a marathon ever since you know i was a teenager you know <laughs> and and i'm still running the marathon oh sure you know? and that's you know that's how my my per personality is so uh what what type of jobs did you do before you finally got the the dream job so to speak well, I actually, I was doing small low budget films when I first started. You know, I started doing this movie called Spooky, which has become a big cult type of movie that, that everybody kind of talks about to this day. Um, um, you know, that I, and, and even when I was getting occasional movie jobs doing effects and interning for people like, you know, established artists in New York and getting in touch with Dick Smith, who did The Exorcist, and was Academy Award winner for Amadeus. Um, you know, these type of people are the people that helped me back then in New York. You know, we're established people, but even between jobs, if things weren't going the way they should, I would go out and get a regular job. I would, you know, I'd be like, uh, I'd be a trucker's helper 
or I'd work in a warehouse, or I'd be a salesman. Um, I mean, anything I could do in my young teens and early 20s to always keep money coming in to support my hobby and to do new portfolio pieces. If I wasn't working on a film, I was sculpting or doing something to put in my portfolio. I, my goal was to have the best monster portfolio filled with creatures and monsters um, and more than anybody else had even in the business and I, I mean that's what kind of drove me all the time was to keep pumping creatures and characters out as much as possible in my free time so were you a big fan of the universal uh, monster creatures then you know not as big as some people there were huge fans of people of Frankenstein and Dracula and the Wolfman and all that stuff and I am a fan I'm, I'm a big fan but I think the only movie that grabbed me back then that kind of scared me and and um uh, was like, um, you know, probably Oliver Reed, you know, in Curse of the Werewolf, you know, that, that sure. there was something different about that, and it was in color, and it was, he's in this ripped shirt, and he's this hulking werewolf in a hallway, and, and there's something sexual and rapey about this fucking werewolf that kind of, <laughs> like, kind of like, ooh, what's going on? You know, this is different, you know? It's different than some, you know, guy in, in, in you know, in a, in a furry head, you know, running around in a shirt yeah. and a pair of ripped sh- you know, and it was just different. And so that grabbed me more. And to be honest with you, I'm a kid of the 80s, so uh, my horror classics, um, you know, some people say Frankenstein, my horror classic is The Thing. Okay. Okay, um, you know, so Rick Baker loves the, 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 the Frankenstein image. I'm, my, my inspiration or my, my fandom goes to the spider head and The Thing on the floor. That's, that's my classic horror films for me. You know, um, American Werewolf and, uh, you know, The Howling and, you know, things like that. You know, Joe Dante and, and John Landis and Steven Spielberg. These are my horror classics. Even though I appreciate the old movies and love them, I'm not like a, oh my God, you know, drooling over that stuff like, you know, <laughs> a lot of other people are. You know, I'm more of the, like I just said, the 80s are sure. more of my horror classics. Yeah, I'm I'm a kid of the '80s too. I'm only 29 years old. I was born in uh, 1983, so I'm kind of more a kid of the '80s, kid of the '90s, more or less, you know, or 2000s. But I uh, my mm-hmm. favorite my favorites uh, growing up were the Ghostbusters series, uh, Teen Wolf, oh, of course. Back to the Future, you know, and like Eddie and the Cruisers. I mean, that, those are my favorites. And Batman with Michael Keaton. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I have a very eclectic style. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I was scared to death with you know about Night of Living Dead and. You know, uh, the, the, the black and white movie had a big influence on me, and I loved, you know, a lot of the Italian movies that, you know, I remember seeing that, you know, um, when I lived in New Jersey, and I'd go to this Cuban theater that was showing horror movies, and that was one movie I would see. You know, I, I like good, you know, and I also, you know, some people like bad, bad horror movies. I like good, bad horror movies. I'm not like the real, you know, trashy type of movies where, you know, the, you just have a monster and, and, and the acting is like a porno movie. That's not really in a appeal to me, nor am I a gore, gore master, I, even though I do gore, um, I am not the type of person that likes to just watch people torn apart, and, it, and even if it's well done, that I go, ooh, that's awesome, I can almost, you know, you know um, I think the only gore that I ever got off on and said, wow, that's amazing, is stuff maybe like Paul Verhoeven did, you know, in Starship Troopers, or, or say John Landis did in American Werewolf, I call it, I'm a fan of classy gore. So, uh, <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, um, yeah, that's my own term for it, but um, that's what I'm a fan of. Okay. And that's why when I did when I did get a chance to do classy gore, which I did in, in, in the first studio movie that I was in my 20s, that I actually got to take over, uh, was Last of the Mohicans. Oh. And, I did cl- and I did with my crew classy gore. And it's the same that goes for Flags of Our Father or Leslie Ujima. We did a silicone animatronic burn mask that's never been done that way because most of the time those type of effects that are done are they look like a Mr. Clean or a Halloween mask and they're cut away real fast so they just take like a mask of a guy and they put fire gel on and they burn it. These actually had expression and, uh, you know, basically have a feeling of, emo- of emotion. So Clint held on those a lot longer and so, you know, we did groundbreaking silicone work way back in 2006 that has never been done before and um, 
And, uh, you know, I always try uh, with the opportunities I get like that to do something that is different or groundbreaking in some way. Okay. Yeah, uh, when it comes to Dancing with Wolves, uh, where was it filmed again? Was it filmed in North Dakota or, or South Dakota? Because I live like two I'm, hours away from North Dakota. I'm sorry, what, 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 I'm sorry, what film did you ask about? About Dances, Dances with Wolves? You said you worked on that film? I I did not work on Dances with Wolves. That was last weekend. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, I yeah. That no, sense. no problem. No, no. Dances with Wolves was, um, I believe, shot in North Dakota. Okay. And I give a shout out to uh, a great studio here in L.A. called uh, KMB Effects. And KMB Effects, uh, run by Howard Berger and Greg Nicotero. Did animatronic buffalo for that, so and no, that was not my company. That where was where was uh, where was uh, Last of the Mohicans? I mean, uh, filmed. Uh, that was shot in um, Asheville, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Oh, okay. Um, and um, um, and so yeah, it was a great deal of that. And I was on that for about seven months. Okay. Did you got to actually go to the location where they were filmed and got to help uh, with the, oh, the gore yeah. effects? No, 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 yeah. I actually took over the makeup prosthetic effects, which was run by Neil, I'm sorry, Neil, uh, Nick Dudman. And um, and uh, Nick Dudman, uh, due to some personal reasons, left the show and then um, recommended me uh, to take over the show um, and for, you know, uh, you know, for the rest of the movie, um, I, you know, coordinated, designed, supervised, and put together a crew, and did and applied um, and sculpted makeup effects for that film. And that was the first studio movie, you know, in my early twenties that I actually, you know, ran the show and, and did effects for with one of my favorite directors, was Michael Mann, who at the time was doing Miami Vice as well. And wow. uh, I was uh, very honored to work with somebody of that stature. Uh, one of the more favorite movies that uh, that you got to work on that are actually it's one of my favorite movies that I didn't mention, but uh, Super Mario Brothers. How the heck did that happen? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, um, there there is a lot of people. Like, it's a love hate relationship with that film. And I recently did a panel at the New Art uh, with the uh, and the production designer of the film, David L. Snyder, who's actually the production designer of Blade Runner, uh, was production designer on Super Mario Brothers. And I got involved with that film because when I was on Mojin Games, I got to know a makeup artist called Jeff Goodwin, who was actually the head makeup effects artist and makeup artist on a movie called Blue Velvet. And uh, he said, listen, there's a lot of prosthetics in this movie that's coming up down here in North Carolina. And um, I would like you to come down and, and key it for me. And, um, you know, I'm going to be a head, you know, the, in charge of, of all the regular makeup. But I'd like you to come down and, and you know, help me you know, design and sculpt and, and, and do the prosthetics on, on the film. You know, would you want to do that? And so, of course, I said yes. And I, I went down on, on the movie, and um, we did a lot of stuff that wasn't even supposed to exist because of me, uh, you know, and Jeff pushing, you know, to do prosthetics and to do these, these characters. And so I wanted doing some characters. And I went doing this monkey transformation in the film uh, towards the end with Scarpelli, who go, changes into a monkey um, with Dennis Hopper shoots him with a de-evolution gun. And I was down there, and I got to party with Dennis Hopper and, and John Leguizamo and Samantha Mathis, and it was just an amazing, great experience um, that I will never forget. That. And, and it seems like it, it's a lot different than what what we what we get in the video games. That movie. Um, uh, well, yeah, because when you're doing a translation of something that is um, very childlike and niche you know, to do a live-action movie, there's going to be a translation that's going to happen that, you know, is not exactly going to be the same from, say, a movie like that, you know. I mean, a movie like that, you know, um, uh, actually there was a script that was a lot more serious and a lot more grittier when I first read Super Mario Brothers, and then it changed. Um, and, um, you know, I look at that movie with a certain charm now, you know, that, um, um, you know, I, when I saw it at the New Art, when I was talking on the panel, and then when I got to see the movie again, it was like, this movie isn't as bad as everybody says. It's a fun, stupid ride, and it's, it's the kids' movie, and, uh, and that's how it should be taken. So, um, um, you know, so that's kind of the wrap-up on what I did with Super Mario Brothers. It's it's kind of funny they never did a sequel because uh, I would have loved to see a part two with the same cast and everything. Well, it was a flop, you know. It, it didn't do very well, you know, and um, and it got panned. And so, um, you know, like anything, um, 
you know, um, if something's panned and it's a flop, there's no more money in it. Uh. And so studios weren't taking a risk like that. I mean, today they're doing it like if, say, the first Hulk wasn't doing very well, like, yeah. you know, and it did, you know, they'll go, well, let's, let's reimagine it, let's regroup and, and redo Planet of the Apes. You know, by Tim Burton was in a lot of ways some sort of a disaster. You know, it wasn't it wasn't what people expected, and the fans really didn't want, like it. You know, Rick Baker did some amazing, you know, hate makeups, but they the, studi- the studios knew there was something there, and they and they said, you know what, let's be imagining, and they wound up doing the, the Rise of the Planet Apes, which was very successful and very critically acclaimed. Now, back then, in you know, in the, in the eighties, you know, if a film was a flop. Studios weren't going to risk another, you know, hundred million dollars to put into a film that was a flop. Yeah, you know, so, so you know, it, that's why you don't see a sequel because the movie wasn't a success. Which is, ki- which is kind of funny because most of the stuff that you saw in the 80s, I mean, there were a lot of hits, of course, but there were a lot of flops too that are still cult classics to this day. Oh yeah, well no, yeah, it, it, it didn't generate. Well, of course, but you know, it didn't generate you know the excuse to to make uh, another film. Uh-huh. You know, uh, back then if they were flops, you know, what I mean, but yeah, a, a lot of movies are are gems now that were considered. You know, I mean, the thing was uh, it was a financial flop when it came out because it came out around the same time as ET. Yeah, and so ET destroyed it in the competition and. Um, and, uh, you know, it got bad reviews, and uh, even, uh, I think, some of the original cast kind of panned it, you know, from, from the Howard Hawks version. The actors from then that, that uh, were involved in that film, uh, you know, I think one or two actors came out and said that, you know, uh, it was just a gore fest, and, and so it was a flop, but now it's considered a horror sci-fi classic. Oh, sure. And, and, and it kind of reminds me, too, like, all the, uh, like, when you talk about horror and stuff, like, all the, uh, like, the Halloween uh, sequels, uh, all the Freddy and Jason and Chucky and all those, it's like, you know, I don't know how good the sequels were, but they must have been all right to, to, keep, uh, to keep them going. Well, I mean, a good friend of mine is Tom Holland. I mean, he's a very good friend of mine. He directed the first Child's Play, and, and uh, you know, and ironically, I wound up working on Child's Play 3, um, in the in the, in the early eighties, or late eighties, mid eighties, um, when um, I worked for a man named Kevin Yeager, who actually designed the the new Freddy after David Miller did the first Freddy, and uh, um, so I wound up working on Charles Play Three, and uh, yeah, there is there 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 are franchises that continually make money, and Hollywood knows that, or nor would or would they continue not to put more money into them, so. You know, Child's Play th- series was a very successful series and, and continue, continues to be to this day. So I don't know how many there are right now, but I mean, uh, you know, there must be seven movies, six movies, whatever yeah, it is, Child's like Play. Um, I think a new one just came out or was out or coming out. I don't know. I don't really follow them. I'm not a big <laughs> fan of doll, mo- doll horror movies anymore. Um, <laughs> um, so it's not on my radar. Yeah. Um, but they, they do make money. And, and they continually make those, you know. I think the new trailer just uh, here yesterday or a few days ago, I, I saw it, and I wish they would have made the trailer longer because they only, they only show a, a minute and 15 seconds of it. And that, to me, it's, it shows a lot of clips, but it still doesn't do it for me as far as, like, like I want to see more, you know. I want to see, like, a two- or three-minute trailer, you know. <laughs> what, what's the, what trailer are you talking about? For the, uh, more? For the uh, Curse of uh, Chucky, the new one that just came out. Oh. That's coming out in October, well, okay, I guess. I, well, then it, it might be a good one. I'd like to. That, that's cool. I'll check it out. You know, when it probably comes to DVD or um, or, or video. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to check it out. Um, but um, you know, like I said, I'm not a big. I mean, I wasn't a big fan of the remake of Freddy. I wasn't. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of the Halloween movie remakes. You know, um, at all. Um, uh, I wanted to like them, but I didn't. Um, 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 other than that, I, 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 there's a lot of horror movies that come out that aren't really fresh and, and aren't really, you know, don't have a spark. I mean, there is, um, I worked on a film, uh, which was done for a very, very low budget, um, done by a very creative guy, um, named Stephen, uh, C. Miller, who, um, did this film called Under the Bed, and it's the same producers that did these, uh, VHS, uh, horror movies, um, okay. VHS 1, VHS 2, and there's a VHS 3 coming out. Um, 
uh, which by the way we're working on uh, um, right now. Um, um, so, um, but under the bed is creative and and you know has a really cool monster and really really good performances, really good acting, and um, you know so that's a horror movie that's 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 coming out um, on July nineteenth that we effects for um, that's a really good horror movie and gives that flavor of the eighties. Uh, of of like a uh, you know Steven Spielberg or Joe Dante movie you know of and it has a Twilight Zone aspect to it but since there's a dimensional doorway that opens up under a kid's bed oh, oh. and this creature from another dimension is out of it and um, and it's really well done I mean you know just as a movie as a small film it's really well done it's gotten a lot of great reviews and um, I really recommend it not just because they did the effects like if I didn't even do it wow that's a really cool movie. It's really well done and done on a little budget. It looks like the DP, Joe White, did an amazing job. He shoots all of Darren Lynn Bowsman's movie, the guy who did the Saw series, yeah. um, who's another great friend of mine. And uh, we, we, we work on Abattoir right now, which is um, um, a comic book, graphic novel that, that, that he came up with. And, um, and uh, we're doing that with a studio called Hikes. Um, um, the same directors and, and guys that did um, Alien vs. Predator, or never Alien vs. Um, Requiem. Versus Requiem um, um, are producing this film called Tour, okay. and we're doing uh, effects for that as well. So, uh, all the movies that you worked on, what's uh, what's one that's your most favorite? Well, I have essentially, um, I'm going to say Devil's Carnival by Daniel and Bowser, which is a um, um, I have a, a musical thing in me a little bit. Not that I dance around or anything, but I, I have um, a fandom for for great musicals. Um, and this one is the Mark Picture Show. And oh, um, oh. it is called The Devil's Carnival, and we wound up doing a lot of characters. Uh, you know, we wound up designing Satan and uh, all kinds of uh, religious people and, you know, all kinds of the dozens of hell. was basically a carnival in hell. And um, it was like working on a uh, legend, you know, that. And um, it's just beautifully shot again by Joe White. Um, and um, great DP. Um, and it was uh, ama- another amazing experience. So that was, in my, my recent memory, one of the fun ones that I really got to work on that I absolutely love. Um, and I, and also, um, the other one was Under the Bed. Um, anything with Steven Seagal that I worked with, you know, I, I did uh, Silent, which was uh, kind of a, um, a holiday Christmas horror movie. I also got, got the executive producer credit on that, thanks to, um, you know, um, the producers on that, you know, um, um, Mr. Saperstein and uh, Shara Kay and, and Steve Miller, I got to be an executive producer on that as well as doing the effects. And, I, and you will not see a better head chopped in half animatronically and done in silicone than in that film. So you check it out. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> cool. Wow. You know, I mean, and I'm not a poor meister, but when I looked at it, I was like, wow, I really did that. That looks cool. That looks real. That looks great. You know, that was fun. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that was like, well, I was like, wow, that was cool. I think they actually edited it and shot it right, and yeah. it was great. So, um, you know, you should check that out, you know, because the effects are really cool in that. And, and um, sure. another, another favorite is um, um, Sushi Girl. Um, uh-huh which uh, had a, a whole genre cast in that, Noah Hathaway and Andy McKenzie, David Delmarsh oh, wow. and Mark, Mark Hamill, Tony Todd, um, um, you know, just a great cast, James Duvall, and that was another awesome experience produced by Neil Fisher and, uh, um, and um, directed by Kern Saxton um, and, uh, and Dennis Palace. Uh, great, great movie, amazing film, and a great experience to work on. So these are some of the recent favorites that I've worked on uh, that I absolutely love being a part of. Oh wow! Well, that's that's pretty cool. It seems like you seems like you have a lot to be proud of. I mean, the fact that you've been able to to have a career like this, so you so you're not working at a grocery store anymore, or you're not you know do work working at the warehouse. You're you're doing what you love, and I think that's great. That's what kind of makes you a, an icon of pop culture in my eyes. Anyway, I don't know if the whole rest of the world sees it but on this show. Anyway, I see it that way, and that's why I wanted to do the interview with you. Thank you so much. It's a real honor for you to say something like that. When I hear things like that, I go, I go, really? You know, but then I go, okay, well, that's cool. You know, so I mean, you know, I'm glad in, in, in some ways 
um, I'm, I'm making some sort of an effect. I'm making some sort of signature in some way. Um, and, and I'm honored that somebody would say something like that. It's really, really cool of you. It's really, really nice of you. And it's nice to be in, in what I call that club. Because there are people I look up to. There are actually studios that, that do effects that I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, even though they're, all, you know, in a way competition or we're all doing the same thing, but that I look up to and go, you know what, these guys are great. You well, know, and uh, and uh, and I'm friendly with you know, and that I really I, I'm a fan of what they they do, you know. Yeah, and, um, I, and I feel the same way with you. I mean, that's why I started do, doing interviews in the first place because I started doing interviews back in, in June of 2006, but it didn't really go off until at least uh, a year ago when I decided to, to bring it back. And and since then, I, I think you're my 54th interview that I've done since August of last year. <laughs> Wow! With wow. all types of entertainers, and even uh, even Henry Thomas from ET, and and Lou Ferrigno, who was uh, the original Hulk. So, <laughs> oh, Lou, you got you got to interview those guys. Oh That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm trying my best, and, and I, I want to start to get to know people. So like, if, if you know of anybody that uh, would like to be a guest on the show, you mentioned like Noah Hathaway and and whatnot. I would love to talk to him. <laughs> um. Well, he's very accessible, and he's a really good close friend of mine and uh you know he's a great guy as all the actors are on, on sushi girl uh you know uh you know mark hamill too is my second time i worked with him because i did kevin smith's uh james silent bob's uh uh strikes out with with uh, mark hamill because uh you know uh you know i had a really good time with mark on that and then i wound up seeing him again on sushi girl and then i wound up making uh, a hand for him as a gift. I, you know, I took out of my molds from 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 that time because he was supposed to get a a cock knocker hand. And so on the set of Sushi Girl, you know, thanks to Kurt Saxon and all the producers and sure. you know Neil Fisher and everybody on that, that I was able to, you know, introduce a uh, the cock knocker hand to Mark Hamill, and he wanted to film it that day on set of Sushi Girl. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so that was fun. And Mark, oh, yeah. Mark's a great guy. So uh, the last question I have for you before we wrap up this interview, and thanks again for letting me, uh, uh, or for finding the time anyway. I know you're a busy guy for letting me do this interview with you. It's uh, it's, it's definitely an honor. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm sorry that my schedule's been kind of so all over the place and crazy, but you know, it's almost like a moving target that <laughs> I'm involved in. I'm, my own business is a moving target, and I have to kind of stay on it, and if I don't, you know, things kind of, you know, fall apart. Oh, sure. So, <laughs> kind of, you know, I'm kind of a one, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, um, one guy, but I, I wear 70 hats, you oh, know, sure. um, so I'm a real a micromanager when it comes to my own studio. So the last question I have for you, uh, basically, uh, I try to ask this a lot to a lot of the big, big entertainers, and, and so I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, what advice would you have uh, for who wants to get into the movie business? Um, have a lot of love. Um, don't change. Don't change who you are. Don't sell your soul out to work on a movie. Be real. Um, I'm not um, into Hollywood phonies at all, even though I have to deal with them. Um, and, and you have to deal with people sometimes that you don't want to deal with to keep your business alive and pay the rent. But my advice is to keep who you are, keep integrity, keep honest, and have the love is very, very important um, in this business uh, for this stuff. And have patience. And don't let anybody ever take away what you want to do when you have a dream. If somebody says you're not good enough or you're not as talented as this guy or you don't have what it takes or you're this type of person or you don't know what it's, you know, you don't know what it really is to be, you know, this in the, in, in the movie business and you have all this negative filtering coming in, you need to filter it out and always not let it become part of you or because it will drag you down. So the thing is, is to always move forward and be positive and keep the love of the dream that you have. Never give up on it, no matter how long it takes. Wow, okay. Well, hey, that sounds good. That's, that's good advice. I hope people, uh, I hope people uh, take that... Uh, Take those words uh, seriously because you know it, it's the truth. You lived it, so and you're still living it even after all these years. Yes, but it also took a lot of sacrifice. You know, it's not like I said. And it, it, there's a great deal of sacrifice. So remember that. You know, and you have to really think about what you're sacrificing. You know, maybe 
you know, your life, you know, personally isn't going to be as the way you want it in a lot of ways because you're running a business or you're in the movie business. It really takes a lot of sacrifice, you know, and you have to really try to judge on that list what you're willing to give up, you know, to do what you want to do or have your dream come true. All right, but man. Try to, do it with try to do it with integrity. Oh, try sure. to do it with respect, you know. That, 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 that's, that's the one thing you need to try and do, you know. Um, don't screw people over to get a job. You know, that's, that's another thing to do. Don't do that. Because it will bite you in the ass in the end. Um, and that goes, a lot, that goes a, 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 on a lot in this business, and it's something that I try to not do. Um, I really do. No matter how much uh, you need to pay a bill or, you know, keep your rent paid, keep integrity and, and, uh, and, and don't screw people over. It's, that's, my, that's, my, uh, that's my big thing. All right. Well, I tell you what, Vince, once again, thanks for letting me uh, talk to you. And, and uh, I want to tell your website again for people to, to go to. It's, uh, it's VGP Effects. You just put VGP Effects, and you will see my entire life. Just put it in Google, and, and it's, it'll be the top search engines, and you'll see my whole career. You'll see interviews. You'll see, you'll see him. If you put images and you put my name in or you put VGP Effects, there'll be a whole plethora of information. Right there. I'm also on Facebook. We also have a Facebook fan page, uh, um, and you know that, that keeps us updated on what we're doing. You know, to, uh, you know, as far as projects now that we're producing, as well as doing a makeup effects for. So you know, we're branching off into that area. So you know, uh, believe me, there's there's a lot of information. So it's VGP effects, um, and uh, you just put that in Google, and uh, you'll have the website. All right. Well, thanks again, Vince, and uh, you take care, my friend. I will. Oh, by the way, when is this going to air, or when will this be? This ready will. To, this uh, will air next week, which uh, while in the recording, it'll sound like next week, but it, it'll air next week. I'm doing like a little mini marathon. I announced that on my Facebook page because uh, I'm moving to Rapid City, South Dakota, here in a couple weeks. So from Minnesota, so <laughs> I'm trying to get everything wrapped awesome. up. That's why. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Well, this was fun. Thank you again. I can't wait to. Hear, uh, you know how this came out and what the feedback will be. Yeah, so thank and, you and you for, can, thank maybe you, you for pursuing me. Sure, and maybe you can uh, put this on your website or, or on your Facebook page or something. I, as soon as I as soon as I hear this and 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 and, and hear who it is, I will I will be promoting <laughs> the hell out of it. No All, right. All right, man. You take care and uh, thanks again. All right, take care. Bye bye. All right, and that was Vince. I'm just going to call Vince uh, Gustani, I believe. Anyway, uh, that was Vince, and uh, I appreciate having him on. Uh, uh, very cool to talk to uh, guys who are in the industry that are artists, filmmakers, as far as the people who write the movie or or, or do the, uh, the the credits or whatever. I like talking about the people who are actually who help make the movie happen, you know. And Vince uh, definitely has in his career has done that, has made history upon history working with different uh, iconic films like uh, Last of the Mohicans and Super Mario Brothers and Child's Play 3 you know some of those people might you know some of those films might sound like they're flops but you know what they're they're, they're big films even to this day I, I don't think it matters how much money a movie should make in order to justify how good it is I think uh, as long as it has a good story and good acting and, and, and at least tries to have a good soundtrack at least you know uh, I think that movie will be great because a lot of people didn't like like the Look Who's Talking series uh, back when it came out probably thought it was like you know stupid and everything but you look at the Look Who's Talking series now and it's a legendary you know I don't think I would change anything when it came to that movie but of course that's not a movie that Vince worked on but I'm just making an example uh, but other than that uh, thanks for tuning in this will be my last inter interview for July, I'm thinking, unless I hear, uh, unless there's another interview that I'll be doing before I move to South Dakota. If, if it is, then I'm going to be taking a couple weeks off, two or three weeks off from doing any more video or interviews or anything like that while I'm in South Dakota uh, because I'm going to be moving down there. I'll live, uh, stay with my Uncle Todd for the time being and try to find a job and uh, live down there for a while. And uh, it'll be interesting because I'll get to see get to see things that I and experience things that I haven't had a chance to uh, experience for quite some time so 
I, I want to do that, and I'm looking forward to that, and it should be a lot of fun. So, I'm your host, Frank Slauson. Uh, have a great day. Have a great or, summer, and we'll we'll see you again for another great Frankie Slauson show video or interview on Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture. I will be making a bunch of videos uh, on my trip to, uh, when I get going to South Dakota, so I'll still keep in contact somehow, some way. All right. This is not the last interview I'll ever do, so don't panic. <laughs> Anyway, so that is that, and uh, I'm just waiting for this kind of, seems like it kind of froze here for the, okay. All right.